1 Samuel 4. Now, for some of you who are familiar with this passage, this is where, this is where the children of Israel, they, thank you, they took the Ark of the Covenant outside of the camp. And then the Bible talks about that when they saw the Ark of the Covenant, that they gave a great shout. And it was such a loud shout that their enemies heard them. But it was done in the wrong way. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 4. You'll notice that the Word of God reads concerning about the Ark of the Covenant at verse 5. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. Now look at verse 3. This is their problem. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Now notice that this antagonized their enemies, that at verse 6, the Philistines said, And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Look at verse 9. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. Now, if you'll notice that in this passage, that the children of Israel, they put their wrong faith in an object, in a wrong thing for their faith, and they gave a mighty shout for that one, and then it antagonized the enemies where they did their wrong faith in their wrong shout as well. And then obviously, their enemies, the Philistines, if you know the story, won the battle. So, what I want to warn is about a wrong shout. So, we're at a great summer camp and a great time, but when you put your faith on the wrong thing and wrong object, and when it is not done in wisdom, and it's not done in the right time, then the Lord is not going to bless it, because you put your faith more in an object rather than in the Lord. So, for example, um, uh, a great example is preparing an event for a revival meeting. I think uh, Pastor Stevenson knew about the street preaching thing. That's quite a time. That was definitely the Lord. But let us say that I were to put my faith in preparing an event, like our last year's blowout. By putting my faith in that to prepare a congregation that can be excited, exhilarated, convicted, by putting my faith in all these things and these logistics and these plannings and you know, a shouting atmosphere, then the Lord is not going to bless it. And it will be my detriment and my destruction in the end. And I hope that you came to this camp not to give a wrong shout because the Lord will not bless it. And then the Philistines, the world, they'll, I'll tell you what, they can outshout you if you have the wrong shout. So we have to be careful of that. There are some times, uh, even myself when I preach, uh, when I shout quite often, it's not the right timing. I remember I was in a small room and I would shout throughout the whole preaching. And then there are some people who say, man, that's a great sermon, Pastor. But then other pers people, I never saw them again. So sometimes you have to think about the right timing, right people, right situation. At a funeral meeting, that's obviously not a time to run around the aisles. Now, there was one when my friend John Hernandez passed away, and Fred, Pastor Fred Hernandez preached the funeral there. Pastor Andrus was there. And then my dad's like, you know you're not supposed to shout here, right? Because he know what kind of man I am. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, don't worry, I won't shout, you know. Yeah, I know, it's a sober funeral. And then Fred Hernandez, for crying out loud, he started preaching and shouting. And then, you know, uh, Abraham, yeah, I saw him getting up and waving his Bible. And then I saw... Uh, other people waving a shout, and I was like, oh, okay, that's my signal. I was like, ah! in a funeral, in a funeral, yeah. That was the right timing, by the way. <laughs> so we have to be careful of the wrong shout. But what happens when you put your trust in the Lord? 
When it's all done in the right way, right manner, right situation, the right heart, right motive, and it's done in the Lord, then absolutely nothing can take your shout. So, that was my introduction. I hope that nothing can steal your shout. The title of my message today is Can't Steal My Shout. Let's pray. Father God, please fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and help me to preach what you want me to preach and help me to be careful, Lord. Help me not to have a wrong shout, a wrong heart, a wrong motive. And outside here at the sun, it's a little bit tipsy for me. And uh, with everything that I'm going through, but I'm going to trust you. And everything is in your hands and in your play. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right then. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 6, please. 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now we're going to look at uh, two passages here. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 6. And then I believe your other hand will have to go to 1 Chronicles 15. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Let me check that real quickly. We're going to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Yes. All right, we're going to go to two passages, 1 Chronicles 15 and 1 Samuel chapter 6. Um, just to give you a heads up, I don't have points in this message, but each passage that I go to will have a basic point and a meaning, okay? Just giving you a heads up on that one, all right? So, so far, uh, we saw one meaning. That was the introduction. The second meaning will be 1 Chronicles 15. The third point or meaning would be at uh, 1 Samuel 6, all right? So every passage we go to, is going to have a message. All right, First Chronicles chapter 15. You'll notice that the Bible reads here that David, he mentioned at verse 13, for because he did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us for that we sought him not after the due order. So King David was saying that the Jews when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the house of God, they also gave a wrong shout. Very similar with 1 Samuel 4. They gave a wrong shout in the Ark of the Covenant being brought. It's the same situation. And they had the right heart to praise the Lord, but there was something wrong in the worship service. They didn't go by the biblical way. That's the thing. So you can even have a wrong shout with a, a right heart and intention and be sincere and claim you do it for Jesus. But if it's done in the contemporary music manner, if it's not the biblical route, the Lord's not going to bless that, right? Now in here, they overlook something. And to be quite honest, compared to the contemporary Christian crowd, King David is kind of like our crowd, so to speak. Our crowd in the way that when we shout, when we praise to the Lord, it's not really done in the right manner, but we don't really mean to. If you look at 1 Chronicles 13, 1 Chronicles 13, you'll notice at verse 8, so this is the same point here, okay? It's the same point. I'm just trying to build up context. Verse 8, and David and all Israel, at verse 8 of chapter 13, played before God with all their might, with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. But then you'll notice that even though that they praised the Lord, you'll notice at verse 10, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark and there he died before God and David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. So you'll notice here that they made a mistake. And because they made a mistake in singing and shouting, thus they quit. They didn't shout. They didn't run the aisle anymore. And they said, I'm not going to do it again because I'm going to offend somebody. Well, look at 1 Chronicles 15. You'll notice at verse 25, So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. So notice that God helped them in the midst of their shouting. And then you'll notice here at verse 28, Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting. Uh, that didn't stop them. Oh, they made a mistake, but uh, it didn't stop them from shouting. They just learned their lesson and they say, Okay, I just 
have to toss the hymnal at the right direction next time. And by doing that, then I can enjoy a better worship service. See that? So, I mean, uh, you might have hit the song leader with the red hymnal, but look, he's still song leading, so don't worry. Just keep running around the room. It's okay. We all make mistakes, you know. Maybe you toss the white hymnal, and then it hits somebody in front of you, and I've heard stories of that at Dr. Upman's blowout. And one person got mad at the person for tossing the blue hymnal and it hit the person. And the PBI student was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But guess what? You still see that PBI student tossing the hymnal. You see the PBI student, you know, running outside the room. He bolted out the door during Dr. Upman's blowout meeting and then he broke the door. And Brother Johnson made him fix the door. But guess what? That didn't stop him from shouting either. <laughs> You know, I know you made mistakes, all right? And yeah, you know, you, you did something wrong. Genuinely, you did something wrong. And then, you know, somebody was angry with you. I mean, uh, you got the Lord angry with David. That didn't stop him from making a fool out of himself, from shouting, offending his wife, and then, you know, just jumping around the room and everything. So guess what? Look, we all make mistakes. So what? You know, don't be offended. Don't be sensitive. Don't be hurt by somebody. You know, if you hurt, you know, with your praising and shouting, just learn your lesson, do it the right way, and shout better for the Lord. All right? Boo-hoo. Wow. Big deal. Okay? Shout for the Lord. I mean, if you toss a chair and you break it, you know, it's only $100 that you lost or paying for it for the Lord. All right? So you, we all make mistakes, you know? But, uh, you know, we can be a little careless. Sometimes I'll tell some of you to, you know, you know, just be careful over here and there, you know. Sometimes I might rebuke some members too. But guess what? I still see them shouting and praising the Lord, all right? Yeah, I would tell Sean and Robert to calm down a bit. But, you know, I, I, I don't see them all sad and depressed and they're quiet, you know. I still see them shouting, you know, running, you know. So I think it, uh, if you make a mistake, so what, you know? Oh, what are you afraid of? All right, I don't know what's the matter with some of you. What are you afraid of? You know, offend somebody, you know? You're going to make a mistake and a boo-boo, you know? Oh, get over with, okay? Get over with and just shout and run, all right? A different way, okay? All right, so just uh, learn to control the zeal and put the zeal in the right manner. Is that so hard to do? You know, if that's so hard for you, then you're back at the introduction. See, your problem is that you're fleshly, you're carnal, you're putting your faith in an object and not in the Lord, and that is your problem, all right? If you want to do things right way in the Lord, please the Lord, and if the Lord says, you know, I appreciate your heart where you worship me, but you know it's got to be done in this kind of manner. There's something wrong right here. You should be humble and you should be happy. You shouldn't be sad and depressed and say, oh, you know, I hurt someone's feelings, so I ain't going to shout anymore. Well, boo-hoo to you, then that proved you were carnal all that time for shouting. Just went by feelings and you're, you know, because you went by feelings, you know, that's why you hyped up. And then when you go through some hurt, you went by feelings and you went down. Well, in the world, you know, whether I'm hyped up or down, I just shout for the Lord. And if God says, you made a mistake, shout, you have to shout this way, run around that way. I'll just smile and say, okay, Lord, and I'll just run around the room at a different direction or shout better. Wow, what in the world, man? Can't steal my shout. Your mistakes can't mis steal my shout. My mistakes can't steal my shout. I've been shouting for 33 and a half years, and guess what? Nothing's going to steal my shout. Amen. Amen. I don't know what's the matter with you people. I think some of you are afraid of making a mistake right now. And that's why some of you are holding back on me. Some of you just can't shout right now, you know, because you're just so scared, you know. What kind of mistake will I make, you know? Uh, all right, Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Okay, good. See, someone's not afraid to make a mistake. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Thank you for the shade. Joshua chapter 6. All right, I like this one. All right, now, now notice throughout all these passages, you're, gonna, you're going to see, we're going to cover the hindrances and events and situations and people that could have stole the shout. But you'll notice that it didn't stop or steal their shout. For David's case, it was his mistake, but it didn't stop or steal his shout. So he kept on going. Uh, I mentioned 1 Samuel 6. We'll go back to there. But let's look at Joshua 6, all right? Now, this is the next point. The next point is Joshua 6 here, okay? And then 1 Samuel 6 will be that next point we're going to cover. 
Now, you'll notice that uh, at Joshua chapter 6 and verse 10, you'll notice that the pastor said, And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice. Oh, but pastor, it's, 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 I, I have to know it's not the right time. Amen. It's not the right day. All right? Stop being carnal, Simon Peter. All right? Just yeah. put up your sword, you know. Put it, okay, put it in the sheath. All right? Just calm down. All right? You'll slay your giant Abishai. Just wait. Okay? Just wait. All right? So don't shout. All right? All right, guys. Don't shout. All right? <laughs> Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth. Oh, that's frustrating. All right. Until the day. Until the day. Until the day I bid you shout, then shall he shout. And there's one thing I don't understand is that when the Lord tells you not to shout, you shout. And when he tells you to shout, you don't shout. You know, you know what your problem is? You're just carnal. That's your problem, see? You just go by your feelings how you go. You know, I just shout nevertheless my feelings. Okay? Yeah. Nevertheless, my feelings, I shout. Nevertheless, I feel my feelings, I shut up. It's that simple. All right? Don't be carnal. <laughs> now, you'll notice that they had a funeral service for the first six days of shutting their mouth and being silent for the Lord is in His holy place and in His holy temple. Yeah. And they just shut their mouths, you know? They had their swords, you know, in their sheaths. They're like, when are we going to kill somebody? When are we going to kill somebody? You know? I want to fight, I want to fight. Just march. I look like an idiot. The Lord says, yeah, that's what the ministry is. You know, patience, love, <laughs> charity, gentleness, you know. It's not a blowout time yet, Robert and Sean. It's not a blowout time yet. We got to wait a little longer, you know. Got to wait a little longer, you know. So uh, you have to go around. And some of you pastors know what I'm talking about. You know, it's not the right time yet. You know, you have to go for the first six days, six years. I don't know how long, you know, six decades for some of you. I don't know. But, but you're just going to have to go, you know, just shut your mouth, you know. And then, you know, just keep that sword in. Keep that sword in until that day when the Lord bids you shout. Amen. And then all of a sudden, then the Bible shows here what they did is that verse 15, and it came to pass on the seventh day. Yeah. All right. All of a sudden it said, and it came to pass on the blowout day. It says, and it came to pass on the summer camp day. And it came to pass on the times of refreshing day. And it came to pass that they rose early about the dawning of the day. Yeah, that sounds like a bunch of eager people. That sounds like I can't wait to go to summer camp. That's like, yeah, nothing's going to stop me, man. You know, they, nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to shout. Yeah, I'm going to shout. No one's going to stop me. You know, yeah, I'm going to shout. I'm just waiting. About the dawning of the day. Yeah, that sounds like a bunch of idiots. You know? Talk about a rooster crowing in the morning that annoys you. Imagine a bunch of idiots saying, I love Jesus early at the morning. Oh, how annoying. <laughs> Encompass the city after the same manner seven times. So they had to wait a little bit longer, right? So at the start, early in the morning, we're like, when's the blowout going to start? They go two hours in line, you know. When's the blowout going to start? When's the blowout going to start? When's it going to start? I want to start. I want to start, you know. Uh, just, you just got to wait, you know. Yeah. Amen. Uh, only on the day they compassed the city seven times, so they had to wait a little longer, you know. Uh, so they were waiting a bit. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets. When that first chord was played, all of a sudden, then you know it's amen automatically. <laughs> yeah. Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed. So Joshua, he said, so basically Joshua said, okay, open up your hymn books to page 67. Yeah, amen. All right, and that's when everybody went, ah! And they shouted with the great shout. Now, you know why nothing can't steal my shout? The idea is this, is that because uh, the Lord, I'm under God's permission here. The Lord uh, told me, and He did not give me permission to shout, but, he get, but once He gives me permission to shout, you can't stop that. Not even the walls of Jericho. Not even the walls of Jericho. Guess what? They're going to come tumbling down. So, you know, the devil can't steal my shout. Why? Because God never gave him permission. 
Oh, I can imagine up in heaven, Job chapter 1, the devil tries to attack some of you yesterday or the couple days before, you know, try to prevent you from coming to summer camp. And then the devil, you know, right when you're at summer camp, the devil's like, do I have your permission, God, to just uh, stop them from singing and to steal their shout? And God's like, nope. Amen. No, let them shout, Satan. Amen. Let them shout. I've given you too many permissions to do to them, but no, not this time, devil. So you know why you should shout right now? Because right now the devil don't got permission to stop your shout right now. So I don't know what's the matter with some of you. You are in free reign. You are in free reign. You are under permission by God to praise to the Lord. This is your go-to life, all right? Because one day the master is going to tell you, don't shout. And you know what that's like? You know how frustrating that is. You know, you have to build up your patience, your charity. I know, charity is the greatest gift, all right? I know, okay, I know. All right, I think that's one of our memory verses. I think that should be changed, you know? Yeah. I know, I'm fleshly like you, okay? Yeah, I get that, all right? So then, you know, if you're pent up and frustrated, if God gave you that one rare chance to shout, then you better shout with all your mind. All right, let the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, man. Let it come down, man. So the Lord, the suffering didn't give you permission to stop your shout. Who told you to stop your shouting? Nobody in this room gave you permission to stop shouting. Who told you to stop your shouting? You know, problems that you go through in life didn't give you permission to stop your shouting. Who told you to stop your shouting? You know, oh, I have a spiritual dignified reason. Who told you to stop your shouting? Now, look, we're not trying to make every single person shout an amen. All right? Everybody has their own way of shouting for the Lord. You have to understand that. All right? You don't have to throw a chair to pretend on how spiritual you are. All right? Those people like to attract attention the most probably. Okay? So the thing is, is that what I'm talking about shouting is when you give it all your might to the Lord, and you know what it is. You know what it is, but something's holding you back. Is it an altar call? Is it from fellowshipping with the brethren? Is it just from having a good time right now? Is it from reading your Bible and praying? Is it from singing a hymn? And yeah, maybe it is literally shouting. Who knows? But you know what it is. And something's holding you back that you're not giving all your might to the Lord when He gave you permission to. Now, I don't know who gave you permission or who told you to stop? Maybe it's your flesh. Guess what? This flesh has no permission over you. You got free reign to do what you want to shout to the Lord. So give it out, all right? What's this guy? You know, this guy more important? You know, this guy more important? He don't tell you what to do. I refuse for this idiot right here to tell me exactly what to do. Amen. Amen. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 6. 1 Samuel chapter 6. I don't know. Maybe I think some of you that uh, you're just holding back. You feel like that you need special permission or something or that uh, somebody stole your child. Not, no one has permission to stop you. No one has permission to stop you when God says shout. That's right. Absolutely nothing. So don't let anybody... Don't let anybody try to get permission from God to steal your shout. You got free reign. Go do it. 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now notice this is this, uh, 2 Samuel 6. Excuse me. 2 Samuel 6. So it's 2, not 1. 2 Samuel 6. Now notice that 2 Samuel chapter 6, and this is our next point here, at 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going back to David, where he made himself a fool for the Lord, all right? So David, you know, he tossed a red hymn book and then, you know, hit somebody, you know. So he probably hit the pastor or something. So obviously the Lord wasn't pleased with that. So, uh, so he had to think of a different way to shout. So he decided to keep shouting for the Lord at 2 Samuel chapter 6. You'll notice what happened here at verse 6 through 8. We read that, right? Verse 6, And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark. 
And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. So notice that the Lord stopped them uh, from shouting, from praising his name. But then when you look at uh, when he got the second time to do it, and the second time when he did it, it's different from the first. What happened is that at verse 12, the second time when he praised the Lord, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. Uh, but he did it to the point where he embarrassed his wife. Now here's the thing, his wife wasn't embarrassed at the first time. I don't read that anywhere. But the second time she was. So what happened? That means David really made a fool out of himself the second time. Something just made him really shout. Something just made him di this time, you know, I haven't, you know, ran around the bases for a long time, you know. Maybe this is the time I should run around the bases. So that verse 16 is that hindrance. His wife was upset at him for making himself look like a fool for the Lord. All right, so then he must have done something like really embarrassing. I mean, really embarrassing. I don't know. He probably tossed a chair up in the air, you know. I don't know what he did, you know, screamed louder. Woo! I don't know what he did, you know. He probably did, you know, cartwheels, <laughs> somersaults. I don't know what he did. But there's something about the second shout that was different from the first. What's my main point here? When you give your first shout, uh, you do shout for the Lord. You praise the Lord. But when the Lord holds you back and something bad happens in your life, for some weird reason, then when the second time God lets it go, you seem to shout a little harder. Uh, let me give an example. You know, the first two years of our blowout in our church, well, that was pretty good, don't you think, guys? There was something about the third for some weird reason. Some of the people told me that they liked the third better than the first two, which surprised me. Now I was thinking, you know why? There was something. The Lord allowed some kind of virus and plague to spread, and then he shut off the singing and the shouting, and then he allowed bad things to happen to his people, and then under wisdom, we had to do our own way of worshiping the Lord. And the Lord's like, you know, not yet, you're going to have to do it this way and stuff like that. And because God did that upon us, when God says, okay, I give you permission at the third blowout, you can sing, shout, do whatever you want, and then when we did that, for some weird reason, you know, some more people start to toss him those. Some more people start to run around. Some, you, know what you're, you know why? Because there's something different about the third one. You've been oppressed. You've been shut out. And then even though you're, you praised the Lord before, the, the third blood, it was something different. It was something where you did something more crazy or more wild. You know what that was? That was the Lord. So here's the thing is that... Uh, what I think is that uh, after the, uh, you know, we have our own way of praising God, praise the Lord. But when the Lord shuts some things down, or when bad things start happening to your life, and that should mean, that should mean that when next year's summer camp comes, I'm just going to run even harder. I am just going to shout even louder. I could care less. Amen. And then, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to go Mickey Mouse voice for five days straight. And I'm just going to bang the chairs. And yeah, I know the first three summer camps, you know, I praise the Lord. But this, this next year, man, I've been through so much oppression and bad times and hardship. And man, I can't wait for next year to come. And then I'm just going to cut loose a bit. Amen. You know, I think that uh, this summer camp, you should be a little bit more wild, maybe. I'll just put a question mark, you know. Maybe, right? Maybe. Maybe some of you should walk around a bit, you know. Maybe some of you, if uh, you're not the outward type to shout, you know, maybe you should talk a little bit more to people. Maybe some of you who never said hi should about time say hi. <laughs> maybe there's something different about this time, you know. Or maybe God's going to have to do that social distancing, that restriction garbage again so that you can value fellowship and start to say hi a little bit more. Maybe the Lord's going to have to take away your Bible, where, like communist and persecuted countries, so that the next time you read your Bible, you can read it a little bit more. There's just something about persecution, oppression, and hardship that just makes us... Uh, 
Question mark. Shout a little louder for the Lord. Amen. Read the Bible a little longer for the Lord. Pray a little longer for the Lord. You know, run around the room a little more. Pass out tracks a little bit more. Are you getting my memo here? Should, should it be a maybe or yes, I should? Amen. Amen. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. Ask yourself that. Maybe this year should be a little bit more crazy for you. Just maybe. Uh, just maybe, you know. All right. Uh, next passage. Let's go to the book of uh, Luke 19. Luke 19. Let's look at Luke 19. Shouldn't uh, our praise and worship for the Lord get better and better? That's right. Yeah, it should, shouldn't it? Yep. It should get better and better. There's something about the second and third or fourth time when you praise the Lord that's so much better than the first. I don't know. If you look at your record, is that the case? Preach. Is that the case? Something about the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time, the seventh time. And it just gets louder. The shout just gets crazier. You just get more outward. You get more bold for the Lord. You use more wisdom. And then you just, uh, even wisdom, patience, and love is magnified even more. There's just something where you do the Lord something more for the Lord when you live for Him for 10 years compared to the first year. Shouldn't it be done that way? Maybe it should be done that way. All right, we're going to look at Luke chapter 19. Ah, here's, a, here's another hindrance here to the shout. Another hindrance to the shout right here. We're going to look at the book of Luke chapter 19. Notice that Jesus Christ was coming into the city. We'll look at verse 35. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. I see another pointer right here where they've been, they try to hinder a shout. They try to hinder the praise to the Lord. But Jesus, he said, no, if, uh, if they are not going to cry out, the rocks are going to cry out for me. Now, you notice what Jesus said about these people? All right, this is something to shout about you. Listen to this, all right? It's first sober, but it gets you excited. You'll know what I mean, all right? Listen. You got to realize that when Jesus was coming to the city of Jerusalem, all right, and then he accepted the praise and worship of these people, and he liked it, and he loved it, and he re happily received it, but he knew that these same people would cry out, crucify him, a couple days later. If I were in Jesus' shoe, I would not receive their praise. I would say, you bunch of liars. You... Thank you, Pastor, for the sermon. No, you liar. You don't mean that, you know. You're going to betray. I heard that you've uh, been talking behind my back to other people. On. See, no one's going to like that. And Jesus, so he knew he had every right and reason to reject their praise and their worship, but he accepted them, even though they were going to kill him and murder him. You know, it's such a sobering thought that God knows that... Uh, even after we shout and sing for him at summer camp, that some of you are going to crucify him again. You're, you're going to mess up and sin again. And you're going to let him down. You know what's amazing? And Jesus says, it's okay, I know you're going to mess up, but hey, stay in the altar a little longer. Hey, go ahead and shout for me. I'll receive the worship. And I know that you're going to mess up in sin and iniquity right here and here and here more than you do. But guess what? I love your shouting. Why don't you shout on for me? Some of you are discouraged by sin and addiction and some things that you're struggling with in your life. That should not steal your shout. If I were you, I'd give every right to shout to the Lord and praise His name, especially when He's so good to me and when He realizes how many times that, how much I'm a crud I am and garbage 
wretch that I am that he'd receive this garbage right here and let and allow me to praise him. And you can't shout. You can't shout after that. You can't shout when Jesus Christ, he'll receive your shout. Even though you're going to sin, you're going to mess up. What's the matter with you? Uh, uh, guess what? Uh, I, I, nothing's going to stop me from tossing a hymn book. Nothing's going to stop me from running around the room. Nothing's going to stop me from shouting for the Lord. Nothing's going to stop me from street preaching. Nothing's going to stop me from reading the Bible, praying, going to church, and trying to be a blessing to people and fellowship and get on my knees and pray and read that holy book. Woo! Nothing's going to steal my shout. Amen. Amen. What in the world, man? What in the world? Nothing, absolutely nothing's going to steal my shout for the Lord. I'm going to keep on going. Amen. I, uh, I mean, you, shouldn't you shout for the Lord? Shouldn't you praise and bless His holy name that yeah. despite of your sins? Think about it, okay? You just don't realize how much garbage you are. That's your problem. That's right. Just think about how much garbage you are. And think about how many times that you just let Him down even after a revival meeting, oh, yeah, okay. even after your shout, all right? Do you realize how much of a sinner that you are? After realizing that, can't you shout when you sing Amazing Grace that saved a wretch like me? Can't you run around the room and then give glory to his name on all hail Emmanuel? Can't you just be happy and smile when you sing Tis Marvelous and Wonderful? What's the matter with you? My goodness, some of you. Man, you don't realize what God got you out from, man. And let me repeat again, I'm not trying to get you to do some kind of outward action like this or something like that. I'm not trying to get you to run around the aisle. But what I'm trying to get you to do is, you know, nothing should steal your own way of shouting for the Lord. But something's holding you back, man. And then some of you uh, just look at your sins and that's your problem. Jesus Christ says it's under the blood. That's all he says. All right, every time you sin and mess up, you know, and you're like, I wonder, can I praise his name? And Jesus says, sing along with me. It's under the blood. Praise his dear name. My God, I messed up. You're not singing with me. I'm not what I used to be. My life has been changed. I'm happy reminding him. Oh, God, it's so hard. I think you need to remind yourself, all right? Not the devil. That's your problem. Sing along with me, child. I'm happy reminding him. It's under the blood. Amen. All right. Amen. All right, good. Look like nothing stole your shout. Okay, then. All right, look at Acts 16. Acts chapter 16. Can't steal my shout. I mean, God's too good to me, especially all the times that I messed up in my life. Praise the Lord. My goodness. Why would I stop shouting for Him? He's been too good to me. Amen. And He's even willing to accept my praise, my Ooh. worship. Can you imagine that? He deserves better praise and worship from other beings. Those cherubim, I mean, think about it, man. You got cherubim surrounding the throne who didn't mess up one time. Yeah. And God hears their praise, but He's willing to say, hold for a while and amen. hear our praise and our songs to That's him. Amazing. Wow. That is amazing. I don't know why that you just sit down after that and then just hold everything to yourself and not just give your own way of shouting for the Lord. Amen. Oh, God is so good. Thank you, Lord. God is so good. Can't steal my shout after that. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. You know this story. You'll look at verse 22. So it's Paul and Silas. They've been beaten. Acts 16, 22. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas cried and whined and complained and say, God, why did you allow this to happen? They prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them and sudden, suddenly there was a great earthquake. Amen. Yeah, man, that's, you know what can't steal my shout? Suffering. Suffering should not steal my shout. As a matter of fact, it should enhance my volume a bit more, you know. 
You know, if I have enough voice and volume to cry about my sufferings, I think I got enough volume to praise his name. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I can go by, this, uh, by so much emotion and crying and tears for my own pain, maybe I can cry a bit more on the altar. I mean, there's, uh, I mean uh, there's better things I spend my emotions on rather than myself, man. I'd rather use every emotion that I got to praise the Lord and bless His holy name and to just be happy for all the wonderful things that He's done for me. Amen. Now, you'll notice that in Paul's case, Silas's case, they prayed and sang, when? At verse 25, midnight. Midnight. Well, the world is going on at midnight. Well, at midnight, what's going on? You'll notice verse 22 through 24, they were being beaten, right? They were being beaten, they were being hit, they were being persecuted. And then finally at midnight, they can have a chance to pray and to sing. That shows that their suffering went on for a long time. They went through a very exhausting, tiring day. They were beaten, they were tortured, up till midnight. Or, they were beaten and tortured and when they were in prison, they couldn't sleep at all because of the pain. That's why they were up at midnight. Whatever the case is, the point is, is that they're very tired. There's no doubt about it. They're exhausted. They're worn out. But Paul and Silas says, nothing's going to steal our shout. And they kept shouting for the Lord. Amen. You might say, uh, why is that? I mean, uh, isn't it hard to do that at the beginning? Sure, it's hard to do it at the beginning. That's why they didn't sing, sing praises first. They prayed first at verse 25. They prayed first. Yeah. They prayed first. Lord, uh... I don't know what they prayed, but maybe they prayed, Lord, uh, help me to meditate on the things to rejoice about rather than the things to complain about. Help me to ponder about suffering for you and that I count it as a behalf to suffer for the worthy of Christ. And when you keep praying, you know what happens? And your prayer kind of changes a bit more when God seems to answer and show you a bit more. Yeah, aren't you glad, child? Uh, you know, you, th you thought that you didn't do enough for me, but now you finally suffered for me. How do you feel? And you're like, you know, Lord, uh, I feel a little better, actually. Yeah, aren't you glad the suffering happened? You know, at the beginning I didn't, but now I kind of am. Right. Oh, here's another thing. Don't you think that uh, when you're suffering, it's, uh, it should encourage you because maybe that's how important you are as a target, that the wicked ones, that they'll target you, that they'll imprison you because you're that important? to spread the work of God. And then Paul's like, yeah, actually. And that, that just makes a big smile on your face. And you're like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to just keep pastoring harder and uh, soul win harder and street preach harder. God's like, good, good, good. All right. All right. And then the, the, the frown is turning into a smile. And God's like, aren't I good? Yes, Lord. You're very good to me. And then uh, you feel that pain on your back. Oh, yeah, God. And God's like, I went through a heavier one for you. Aren't you glad that I took that for you? God, oh, this feels awesome. This feels awesome now. <laughs> you took that pain for me. Thank you, Jesus. And then God's like, you know, uh, remember you felt bad a long time ago that I've done so much for you dying on the cross and you want to shed just a little bit of service for me? And I'm like probably, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, you're right. Yes, I do. And God's like, well, now's the time. I don't know why you're not happy. And and then you finally sing a hymn, and then you shout, and then you go, Woo, bless his holy name, I'm suffering for Jesus. And all the prisoners here, and they think you're crazy. <laughs> they say, why, why, what, you got something to shout about? You know, you know what it is? Nothing can steal my shout, not even suffering. You know what the thing is? You need to pray. That's your problem. You don't pray, and you don't surrender to the Lord. You don't listen to his voice. When you listen to his voice and when you pray, and when God shows you something, and then you, uh, Paul, he had it in his mind. He had it in his mind to rejoice evermore. He had it in his mind that suffering costs reward. And because you keep looking at the doom and the gloom rather than the joys that the Lord has given to you in your life, suffering stole your shout. Yeah. Suffering stole your shout. You know what I would do if I were you? It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel pain. It's okay to pour out your complaint unto the Lord. That's what the psalmist said. But you know, while he was crying, he was praising. That's why it's called Psalms. Yeah. You know what David was doing? He was crying and he was shouting. 
You know what he was doing? He was being sad and he was being happy. You know what you need to do during suffering is that when you're going through pain and you recall all the pain and then when you're singing these hymns and some of these words just hit you during times of suffering, boy, you should start crying. You should start shouting. You should start being happy. And you should say, bless God! Amen. Man, I mean, uh, when health problems hit, financial problems hit, church problems hit, and then when you sing, uh, you know, you should be the oddball when we sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And then everybody's life seems to be okay, but then all your friends betrayed you, and no one knows about that. And then when we're seeing what a friend we have in Jesus, you ought to be the oddball in the camp who'd be running around in this room and tossing a hymnal while everybody's looking at you and they're like, wow, that song means a lot to him. Yeah, it means a lot to him. You know why? Because he went through suffering. And because of the suffering, that's why nothing can steal his shout. Amen. Man, what's the matter with some of you? Oh, you had a bad Monday, didn't you? You had a bad Sunday. You had a bad last week. Then I should see you even more happy. I should see you shouting more. I should see you praising the Lord more because you're going to go back to the suffering and the pain right when God gives you permission to shout and to praise and to fellowship and to be restored. Why not give it all your might like the Bible says King David did? Amen. Man, suffering can't steal your shout. You know, when the flesh kicks in and it says, cry, 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 whine, whine, God is bad, God is horrible, then you should sing, God is so good, and you should sing amazing grace, and you should sing, tis marvelous and wonderful, and then guess what, that flesh just drowns out and dies. It goes where it belongs. It's just dead, you know. Flesh, you want to whine about your suffering? Yeah, follow along with me. You go cry in a corner by yourself. I'm going to sing and shout. Let your flesh feel the pain, whine, cry, whatever, man. Let it cry around the corner. You just sing along for the Lord. Amen. All right? Don't take a pity party with your flesh. You're going to be a miserable person. Let all the prisoners hear you shout. All right, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4. It's quite a shout there, right? Thessalonians chapter 4. What's holding you back, man? What's holding you back? What's stealing your shout today? It should be absolutely nothing. When there is more pain, there should be more joy for the Lord. Then the Bible says that the book of Peter in sufferings that we should rejoice in our affliction. I don't know if some of you felt that, but if uh, you know why Paul and Silas did that? I'll tell you why. And when the flesh cries out and says, Duh, why do you want to praise and sing? It's very honest. It's, it's a little bit of a carnal reason, but something that the Lord gave and allowed so that we can enjoy. Because it feels good. Yeah. It sure feels good. Yeah. And in the funeral, you go through the pain of a loved one, passed away and you'll never see again. But it's sure mingled with that emotion of feeling good as well that that person's in a better place. And it feels, it's such a strange feeling. It's a strange good feeling that you can't explain. That's pain mingled with joy. The only oddballs who'd have it is Bible-believing Christians. Yeah. Man, it sure feels good. So when you go through the pain, when you go through the suffering, when you carry your cross for Jesus Christ, man, it sure feels good when you sing page 67, when you sing Ship Ahoy, when you wear a t-shirt that says Jesus saves, and when you try to witness to somebody and you say, you know, uh, I went through a hard time just now, you know, I just lost someone close in my life and I don't want to lose you. I want to see you get saved. Would you like to receive Christ for your salvation? See if they reject your track after that. All these educated medical doctors, how many stories have they witnessed of these people who who are safe Christians and they, they say, I got cancer, but I love Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that uh, there are Jewish doctors, Jewish doctors, medical doctors, who got saved because of such people, who have zero education, who suffer cancer, lost an eye due to cancer. How about that? You know what that is? That's, that's power. Amen. That's power. Don't waste your power. Don't waste your power. 
if you're, if, you're, if you're going through a lot of sufferings right now, there's something going on in your life, if I were you, I'd take up all that pain and then when I contemplate on those hymns and hear the preaching, I'd stay on the altar a little longer. I'd shout a little harder. And then I'd just make myself a little crazy, a little harder. I'd spend more time Bible reading and prayer a little bit longer. I'd just immerse myself in fellowshipping with the brethren a little bit more. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And then uh, we'll close it off right here at verse uh, 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that uh, uh, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now you'll notice that verse 15, there are people who are fallen asleep. So that means they're dead. Well, you know what's going to get the dead to wake up? It's a shout from the Lord at verse 16. Amen. Guess what? Death can't even separate your shout. Yeah, how about that? I mean, there are so many things that killed your life today, but not even literal killing itself will ever stop your shout. And that shout can't keep you down. Now, I, I, one thing I don't understand is that, you know, people seek after this world too much and you don't realize that, uh, hey, not even the world's going to hold, steal your shout. The world can't steal the rapture from you. I mean, no matter how many bad things we go through in life and the frustration, you just look at the governor and say, well, you can't steal my rapture. Call, bless God. Amen. Amen. And you can look at the people in this area and say, well, you can't steal my shout, bless God, at the rapture. One day I'm going to get out of here. You can have this world. If you like this, the rules and everything, the restrictions that you're going through, have at it. I'm going to go up in heaven Amen. where uh, no disease, no plague, no Ooh. nothing, man. Amen. And then, you know, you just got to, when bad things happen, you just got to tell yourself this, well, no one's going to steal my rapture, all right? Yeah. Worst case scenario, you lose a church, you know, you just say, well, nothing's going to steal my rapture. You know, you lose a family, yeah, you lost a family. Nothing's going to steal my rapture. Yeah. You know, you, you lose uh, precious things and you're like, well, yeah, nothing's going to steal my rapture. Yeah. You know, you're dying, you're sick, you're, you, you're being tortured for the name of Jesus. Imagine these people, nothing's going to steal my rapture. Nothing's going to stop the king from coming. Take me home. Amen. Now, why should that steal your shout? Amen. And whenever I see a rapture line, I'm going to shout from the hymnal. I can't say even so, come Lord Jesus. I'm going to say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to his name. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. And saying all the other spiritual words I can say. I just ran out. I will spend every last word praising the Lord because nothing's going to steal my shout. Amen. When that rapture calls, man, when God shouts, I'm going to shout along with him. Amen. Nothing's going to stop that shout. When, uh, when California says, go back to restrictions, God says, get out of here. And nothing's going to stop that one. When Big Brother says, no more church again, God's going to say, we're going to have church up here. Yeah. <laughs> When they say, you know, Jesus, God is so cruel. Why did he allow bad things to happen? Then you're going to say, God, I'm going to be with the good God up there. Yeah, I'm just going to steal my shout. Don't let anything, anybody steal your shout. I mean, you got a rapture. You got a blessed hope. There's, if there's one thing that uh, absolutely nothing, not even death itself, literal death itself can kill your joy, and that's a rapture. Now, why let something steal your shout? Nothing going to steal my shout. So I'm just going to keep shouting for the Lord. Amen. And by the grace of God, I'm flesh and I can fall. But you know what? You're going to see this pastor shouting. And I'm going to keep shouting. I'm going to shout online. I'm going to shout in the church. I'm going to shout to the people and all in the streets. And I'm going to shout in my own personal walk with Jesus Christ. And you'll see this crazy Asian running around the room with holding a chair and tossing it up Woo. six feet in the air. And then you'll see him tossing about probably 20 white hymnals. And he'll look like an idiot. And he shamed his entire Korean culture and race. But I'm going to g give a shout for the Lord and nothing's Amen. going to steal my shout. Amen. And the devil might throw stuff here and, here and there to me. He might attack my church, my family, my people, and even myself and my health. 
but I ain't going to stop this preacher from shouting. Because why? Nothing can steal my shout. No one gave permission to steal my shout. Not you, not you, not you and not you, and not you and not you, and not even the devil, not even hell itself. Only the Lord can tell me that. And you know what God told me to do? He told me to shout! Amen. Amen. All right.